Hello, welcome to the Story Darlings podcast. I am not Tara. <laughs> and I am not Sandra. <laughs> it's like, eh, should probably change it up. It's after the 12th or 13th time. It's like, eh, broken record. <laughs> what are we talking about today, Tara? So we are talking about part two of Ember of Storms, or wow, Empire of Storms. <laughs> Tara has been sick all week, oh. so she's probably hopped up on drugs right now. Empire of Storms. I can read, guys. I can. This whole thing is about us reading, and I can't even read the title right. Empire of Storms. <laughs> Last week, we talked about part one, The Firebringer. So if you haven't checked out that spoilery discussion, go ahead and do that. We also have discussions to The Assassin's Blade, Throne of Glass, Crown of Midnight, um, Air of Fire. So all of that is available. And as Tara said, we're talking about part two today. Fireheart is what it's called. And the book opens up with who is quickly becoming like one of my favorite grumpy gray hero villain types, which is Lorcan. And he and Elite are still with this traveling troupe, kind of like a little circus act. And he is putting his big guns to use in the knife show. And Elite is like a fortune teller, right? And we find out in this scene that Lorcan's power revolves around death. He can sense it in the air and he's really good at dealing out death. And so he senses this attack coming on and they pretty much find out that they are Ilkin right? It's the Ilkin attack. So they survive that and Lorcan and Elite have a little heart to heart and uh, she discloses who she is because the Ilkin said that they were looking for Elite Lokan and he was just like, who is this person? She's been lying to me this whole time. So he's a bit grumpy about it, but wait, is that the scene or is that a later scene? I mean, I think it happens fairly, fairly quickly in the book. But I, I think that they go back after the show because she's jealous of all the girls who are hitting on him. Oh, yeah. This is like, yeah. And he's like, is... she's like, well, go go hang out with one of them. He's like, I think that would blow our cover just a little bit. Yeah, we're supposed to be married, asshole. Yeah, that's right. They have a little bit more of a real talk, but I don't think they disclose like the more serious stuff later until another attack later on. But it's so cute because she is just watching. The knife show is way more popular than the fortune telling. And so she is just standing back watching all of these women basically throw themselves at Lorcan and just fawning over him as he's just doing all his tricks with sharp objects. And he is also taking note of her, which is so cute seeing his perspective on it because he thinks she's like the most beautiful broken thing in the world. And he's not trying at all in his show. He's just like, fine, whatever. Da, da, da. Like giving like about 50% of his like ability. You can only imagine it makes the women go even wilder. <laughs> so, yes, the next scene is, you know, part one left off with Manon being dumped off the side of the ship by Abraxos. And now she wakes to Aelin. You want to talk about that scene? No. Okay. <laughs> All I remember is that she's healing and Aelin is healing her. Yeah. Aelin's basically like, you owe me a life debt now. Another <laughs> one. So, you know, Manon hates that shit. I don't think she's gotten over getting her butt kicked in the, the temple fight. So she's not happy about owing Aelin a life debt. And then she gets a little visit from Princeling. I love this little witchling princeling banter between the two of them. And even though Manon is still very much injured and Dorian is flirting with her in the way that he does, she is still very much concerned about where are my 13? Like, are they alive? Did they return to the darkness? Or, and where is Elid? Did Elid find Aelin type of thing? And that is pretty much that scene. Anything you want to add there? Yeah, her first question is, is there a person named Elid on the ship? Because she has now seen Aelin. And 
she sent a lead to find Aelin. And so her first question is, is she here? And they're like, who the fuck is that? So she gets her answer very, very quickly that Elid did not find Aelin. Yeah, I know that we've talked about Manon's conscience not being up to everybody else's moral code. But at this part, you have to wonder if she feels a huge sense of guilt just dumping Elid off in the middle of Oakwald Forest with her gimpy foot. Like, oh, she never made it. Like, uh, she'd probably feel so shitty. What did you expect to happen? You dump her off in this forest. She has a gimpy foot and it's like miles upon miles that you expect her to walk. And now it's like two weeks later and you're like, oh, she didn't make it those like 3000 miles in two weeks. Like, no, dumbass. She didn't. But then we go back to Lorcan and the Ilkin are attacking and Lorcan and Alid are putting two and two together that they were turned in by somebody possibly with their caravan and Lorcan has a little bit of trouble but not very much trouble and people are catching on that he is more than what he's saying he is because he's not having that much trouble killing these Ilkin and so they go back and this is where they have their heart to heart because he figures out that she's not who she says she is and he also figures out that Aelin lied to him about what she gave him and he figures out he does not have one of the word keys with him but he does figure out that there is a word key there this was a scene between Lorcan and and Elid that we really see Lorcan's temper and a lot of it is directed at Elid because she has been withholding information and we also find out that Elid has a very strong moral code of herself she's very much against killing any kind of murder Even if it's in self-defense, she has like a a problem with it. Like she can't really come to terms with that. Like she understands it, but she still feels very uncomfortable with the need to kill someone to protect herself. And so Lorcan is pissed off at her because she won't tell him about the word stone. Then he finds out that Aelin tricked him in a little snarky note that she left and signed AAG, which I just love. She even like referred to herself like, you need to come up with another word for me than bitch. And in in Lorcan's perspective, he's constantly calling her bitch queen and stuff like that, which is funny because that's how we were referring to Maeve for the longest time. So they decide to haul ass, get on a little barge, and there's like this man on the barge, and Ali doesn't want to kill him, and then... There's a scene where Elid's like hiding under the table while Lorcan finishes up stuff, packs up crap onto the barge, and they book it. She hears a splash. He comes in all frazzled and wet. And she's just like, what happened to the guy? He's like, oh, you know, he jumped off at the last turn. And he says it without meeting her eye. And she's just like, wait a minute. You're fucking lying to me. You killed him. And so they have a a spat. It's almost like a husband-wife quarrel is how they're acting, where he's, like, slamming doors and just throwing a hissy fit. And, yeah, that was that was such an entertaining scene to me. We do get to see more of Elid's backbone. And even though she has a right to be the damsel in distress and, like, help me out and all of that, she is not that person. And she is fully capable of taking care of herself And she will let you know if she disagrees with you. And you see that as she goes against Lorcan, who is this person that could probably kill just about anything. And she's this little girl with a gimpy foot. And she's like, no, no. Like, I know I'm right. We're going to have it out. Doesn't he tell her that he's over 500 years old, too? Mm -hmm. Like, we learn he is hella old. (laughs) But yes, totally agree with Tara. Elite is putting on her big girl pants and learning to stand up for herself. And then a few scenes later, we get to see even more of that, which is very satisfying. But before that, we return to the USS Love Boat. It's just... And <laughs> this is Sandra. Well, there's probably two favorite scenes in this book for Sandra, but this is one of them because I did get a text after Sandra read this one. And Sandra, go ahead, explain your text and explain your, your scene. I I don't remember this text. What did I text? Okay, hold on. Yeah, we have time. I know it was something about Dorian. Was it about Dorian? Yes, it was. It was. 
Okay, let me get this past me David. telling you all about my flu. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. So I have to give a little bit of the story before I tell Sandra's text. So we come back and Dorian and Manon are doing their little flirty thing that Sandra loves so much. And they get a little further than flirting. And then Dorian abruptly leaves Manon chained up hot and bothered <laughs> and Manon is not not happy about that but Sandra's text to me is LMAO Dorian abruptly leaving Manon chained and her rage after and then crying emojis <laughs> it was such a comical scene he does like come back in and then they really like he starts touching her, like using his power on her body to touch her without his fingers. It's a very sensual, sexy scene. But he for real walks out and it just frustrates Manon to no end because she's already quick tempered. And, you know, she's the type of woman, not woman, that you want, like you want to avoid getting in her bad graces. <laughs> but I'm liking the dynamic between Dorian and Manon. It's so just... It's a bit s &M. It's very power dynamics and things like that. And they can kind of hold their own against each other. It's a very exciting dynamic. And that is one thing that I was going to point out is it's nice to see Dorian coming into himself because before he was just like the flirty prince. And I didn't really like him with Selena because she was mouthy and he was just the flirty little prince. And he seemed like he had more ego than he had substance to back that ego up and now he's getting more of that substance and so he's got the ego and the substance and he's on par with Manon and that's nice to see him like owning himself and not just this like image he wants to portray yeah totally and agree. and finding somebody to like mesh with him they have both experienced really fucked up past they can match each other fucked up experience for fucked up experience with him killing his father he is still much more subdued than he used to be he has very much evolved into a different like a sharper kind of character and i think it just works with manon because her fucking grandmother's a psycho too <laughs> evil bitch so you have their little fun scenes going on on this love ship. It's like, okay, if you're at sea, what else is there to do? Then I don't know. It's either playing cards or having sex, I guess, which is what Aelin and Rowan are doing. <laughs> like, I just also have to, like, in my brain, I'm, I'm always the person that's like, does this really work? Like, is this feasible? Because they're on this ship and you have to assume that the walls are fairly thin because like how else would they not be like is everybody hearing everything that's going on yeah i don't is it like a basically this ship. just orgy because they can all hear each other <laughs> i mean and, it could be <laughs> and half of the passengers have like Heightened. better hearing and so like even if the walls were thicker they could still hear and i'm just like that would be very awkward if you were like Gabrielle and Fenris, who are not getting any, just having to listen to everybody else. Maybe I'm blocking this out, but it sounds very college like because college doesn't have the thickest walls either. And you can hear everything every spat between people, every moaning Friday, Saturday night. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, but that just reminded me of an instance where we were in our dorm room and across the like hallway, like we heard somebody fall off the bed and then they said something. <laughs> and I remember us sitting there just laughing like, uh, what do we do? There were some some good stories and things that happened. And Tara and I if you haven't listened to earlier episodes of the podcast, especially season one, Tara and I were very much like, we weren't homeschooled, but we were super shy and sheltered. And then going away to college together, it was just such a learning experience on so many levels for both of us. So we, I feel like we didn't really know how to react to situations a lot for our ignorance. Yes. Yes. To take us out of the mood, 
Fenris shows up, right? And he's he's being weird. Mm-hmm. Weird. Weird. And saying weird things. And I don't remember who comes in, but they're like, that's not Fenris. I think it was like Sandra. It's Manon. Because remember how they can recognize her eyes? So he like reluctantly comes into her room and immediately locks eyes with her. They're like, oh, this is Fenris. Or she's like, who is that? They're like, Fenris. No, he's not. And then it's like all hell breaks loose. Yes, because it is the bloodhound who is there searching for Manon. He escapes though, right? The bloodhound does? Yeah, I feel like he teleported out or vanished or something. Yeah, I think the bloodhound did. But then Fenris shows up, the real Fenris. (laughs) And I'm sorry, I kind of like Fenris. He's kind of like the comedy of all of the shit that's happening. And I get the sense that he doesn't want to be where he is, like at all. He wants no part in any of this shit. And I also get the sense that he has more allegiance to Aelin than he does Maeve, even though he has a blood oath to Maeve. Yeah. And so I kind of like Fenris, even though he's kind of an asshole. He's kind of an asshole. The hot take. It's like, yes, great hot take. If you were blood oath to someone you didn't want to be and she was a huge cunt face, like you wouldn't want to, you'd probably be an asshole as well. But I think it's, everything he does is a sacrifice for his twin brother, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Who made a very, very stupid decision. Yeah, but this vulgar creature that had posed as Fenris tells Manon that Astrin is dead, throws a piece of black leather strap that was uh, that belonged to Astrin, and even goes so far as to tell her about the baby, the witchling baby that Astrin had, and just brings that up, which makes it even more believable to Manon, as Manon is just, like, losing her shit. And so, yeah, that was a pretty dark scene for Manon. Um, and then we followed up with another dark scene where the Ilkin attack the boat and Fenris is hurt. And I'm like, no, please don't kill off Fenris. I just started to like him. They're going through it. I guess the orgy is the only thing keeping them going with positive spirits. <laughs> <coughs> Although... Gavriel does have a good line in that because all of the Fae have their powers coming from something, right? So Lorcan, as Sandra said, has his powers to, like coming from death. And I forgot what Gavriel's comes from, but somebody makes a comment about like, how does Fenris make his shield? Because he can go through walls and he can like, kind of teleport himself. And so somebody, I think it's Aelin, is wondering how he makes a shield, like what his power is, because nobody can figure it out, right? And Gavriel's like, it's of arrogance. He makes it of his arrogance. And that scene just got me, because I'm like, oh, it was just like a like a one-off quip. It, it was hilarious to me. Imagine being in Gavriel's perspective, where you have an estranged relationship with a son you didn't know about. And you're just on a ship with all of these young, hot people. I forget who made the comment. Maybe it was Dorian when he was talking to Manon. But he was just like, yeah, there are a bunch of insanely good looking people on this ship right now. Because they were talking about her not being a woman. She's like a vulg, hodgepodge kind of creature. And And he was like, like, it's okay. Yeah, he's like, you have all the parts that count. (laughs) Oh, Dorian, He's, he's grown so much. And then we go into a little bit of story time because Adian is still giving his dad the cold shoulder, which is so sad for Gabriel because he didn't like, he didn't choose that. That was not his choice. And he mentions that, that there was one time in his life that he regretted the blood oath. And it hints very closely that it was because of Adian's mom. And that he wanted to be with her, but the blood oath wouldn't let him. And so that was the one time he regretted doing the blood oath is because he couldn't be with the person he loved. And I think that thawed Adian's heart just a little bit. Oh, yeah. I think they came to a better understanding of each other. Like a little more respect was made. Like maybe not love and caring yet, but respect was definitely something that came out of that. Aelin was also mysteriously sick. Like vomiting. I don't know if she was seasick or what, 
But Rowan is just like, what the fuck is going on? He, I'm sure, suspects that she's pregnant or something. And so he gets all emotional and in his feelings and turns into a hawk and flies above the ship. Which is where he sees that Ilwe is burning. Ilwe is on fire. And that's the end of that scene. And then we go back to Lorcan and Alid. Which is hilarious. Vernon has found Alid, which is less hilarious. Yeah, before that, what prompted them <clears throat> getting found was she's on her period. And she's like, I, oh, need, yes. I, need, I need supplies. And he's just like... Okay, we'll stop at town and get supplies. And then, as Tara said, Uncle Vernon comes. And this is the part where I started liking Lorcan more, even though he was an ass to Aelin, because he basically says, like, I'll kill him. I'll kill him. Tara loves that phrase. Sam Cortland. No big deal. (laughs) Um. And I love that. I love that when somebody loves you enough that, like, your struggles, your enemies, your whatever are theirs. And it shows that Lorcan is starting to have those kind of feelings for Elite, which is great because Maeve is a fucking bitch. And anybody that we can get away from Maeve and their loyalties away from Maeve, I'm down. Like, fall in love. As long as, like, you choose them, unlike Gavriel did. Be like Rowan. More people need to be like Rowan, where they chose. There you go, Vanessa. Some some major points to Rowan from Tara. <laughs> Vanessa listens, and she's all about Rowan and Aelin. It's important to note that Lorcan is still in love with, infatuated, something with Maeve, even though he is starting to develop these feelings for a lead. So... Keep that in mind because things that play out later, it makes. I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and but do not choose mentioned- the look that I just made <laughs> as my thumbnail, um, please and thank you because <laughs> eh, to where, the being in we, love with Maeve. Where are we at? Twenty nine minutes. Okay, no, okay. no, do not do that. <laughs> Noted. Thank you. As Tara mentioned earlier in the scene between Lorcan and Alid, Alid was starting to stand up for herself, you know, verbally, face-to-face with Lorcan. This one, she takes action, and she starts killing some Milken, right? She promised herself a long time ago that if things got very bad and Vernon got a hold of her, that she was just going to commit suicide before she allowed herself to... um, what happened to Caltaine Rompier, basically, before she could be bred or used to enact violence and death across masses of people, she was going to kill herself. So there's a scene where she's close to doing that. Like, she is about to follow through, and Lorcan shows up to interrupt it, and I think it's like a hacket, like a, is it a hacket? Or like an axe a hatchet? thing? A hatchet. It's a hatchet, and she kills the Ilkin with it, and... I was just like, yeah, go to lead. Because this is huge well, for her. Yeah. And then Lorcan, because she had told Lorcan that, that, like, if she were to get captured, she was not going back. She would kill herself first. And I don't think he believed that she had the strength to do that. And so he was watching her do this. And, and when he got her free and she was alive, he's like, you really were going to do that. And she's like, yeah, dumbass. Yeah. I was like, I told you I would because I'm not going to be used in that way. Needless to say, this whole bonding experience over, you know, her about to do that deed and then killing all of the Ilkin, they come to terms with each other and they have even deeper of a heart to heart. So she discloses the full story. She talks about Caltaine. She talks about what Caltaine sacrificed and what she did. She talks more about, I think, like her uncle and stuff. And Lorcan makes another promise to always protect her, right? To always like be with her and protect her. So we'll we'll see how Lorcan is good on that promise later. <laughs> um, Tara's just shaking her head. <laughs> so Lorcan and Lead are on their way to find Aelin and crew. And Lorcan is being pushed by his like god of death in the right direction. And Elite is being pushed by her god, which is Aeneas. 
right? And these these gods are like, hey, look over here, do this. Like you should be going this direction kind of thing in their like heads. And we get back to Aelin and crew. Okay, so another very, very sweet moment. And I know just a little bit ago, I talked about Fenris and how I think he has more allegiance to Aelin, even though he's under a blood oath to Maeve. There is a really sweet scene and it is between like Gabrielle and Fenris and Rowan. And it is about getting Aelin out of the attack because this is where the Ilkin, like the 500 or whatever, like army of Ilkin are coming towards them. And they're all talking about how to get her out of there and kind of fighting to the death. And Fenris and Gabrielle are talking about the future where Maeve could potentially order them to kill Aelin. And Fenris goes, if that order is ever given, please kill me. And I'm like, oh, Fenris. This is why Tara loves Fenris so much. (laughs) Yes. Like, again, that sacrifice, like you're willing to sacrifice yourself for something that you believe in even though you're not fully in control of yourself. Tara loves action, you know, words that mm-hmm. are backed up by action. Mm-hmm. It's like the ultimate yes. love language for her. Yes. So I love that scene. No, that was a very harrowing scene because Be- it was the first perspective that we got was Lorcan and Elite pretty much camping in the stone marshes as they make their way to this mysterious, you know, temple location that they're being led to. And they're getting kind of, you know, lovey-dovey. Spicy. Getting, it's getting a little spicy. We love to see it. And love doesn't only happen on the ship here. So they're getting very close and intimate with each other in the stone marshes. And his death, you know, the god Hellas, he can sense huge thing of death coming. They look up. It's basically like the moon being blacked out by this army of Ilkin. And they're just like, holy shit, we're all going to die. And... They see, I feel like they see in the distance, like Aelin and her group too, because they're meeting up at this point at the same time. And then it's this big battle to, there's a lot of magic being wielded. There's, isn't Fenris using the shield in a way to like block? Yeah, they're all using shields, I think. Yeah, Dorian's like blasting them and yeah. Well, and before that, they're in this little temple, Aelin and crew are, and Rowan keeps getting this sense of, like, danger. He keeps getting blasted with some magic that is saying danger, danger. And so they go out, and that's when they see the Ilkin. And they figure out that it was Lorcan sending some of his magic to them to warn them that there was an attack coming. And had they not had that, they would not have been able to put a plan together to defeat it. And their plan is to basically send Aelin out alone closer so that she could use her fire on them. She turned this fucking marsh into an inferno, just boiled everything, toads, fish, they're going belly up. She just melted it all. And she almost melted a lead and... Lorcan and the only reason they survived is Lorcan was like oh shit we're gonna catch fire and jumps on a lead and throws up the rest of his magic around them so that they have a shield right and before that another one of those little moments that I'm like oh Lorcan we see that a lead has the ring that protects her from the vlog on and that Lorcan had given it to her even though he fought tooth and nail to have that to where he give it back to Maeve, he gave it to her and told her to never take it off, that it could save her. That's right. And, and, and then he jumped on top of her, threw up his shield, and he's getting burned because the shield is not protecting him from everything. He's getting burned, but he's protecting her. And again, guys... Love language. This book is full of my freaking love language, and I love it. There were a few moments I really, really appreciated about the whole 500 Ilkin battle because right before it starts too, Manon does a lot of growth as well. Like she's coming to terms with her Crocan ancestry, her heritage, and the Iron Teeth, and she gets rid of that red cloak. She just like discards it, and it's very symbolic of her like accepting that part of herself and leaving the hatred of those dueling parts behind 
So I really like that part too. I feel like her and Dorian had a conversation about that because he mentioned <clears throat> that he, his dad was similar and that he was the one who killed his dad. And they have another similarity in being that person that killed a family member, either without knowing or for a rightful reason. They just see each other so authentically. Mm -hmm. They just see each other's reflection back, their experiences. And I think that's why they get along so well. Oh, it was also, Aelin has the eye of Elena on her. And it's Manon that tells her, hey, that's a witch symbol. Like, that's our religion, essentially, is what she's saying. That's the eye of the goddess is what we call it, the crone mother and maiden. And so all of these little pieces are falling together. Because we learned in, like, way back in book two, it had to have been part one of book two, Crown of Midnight, whenever Aelin paid a visit to Baba Yellowlegs, and there was the Room of Mirrors. And so in this temple that they were poking around in, they found a mirror and they can't figure out what it is. It's not exactly a lock, but it Menon's like, this is a witch mirror. So all of these little pieces that have been unfolding very slowly over the course of the series is finally converging. And it's like, it's getting so exciting to see what the big plan is. And that, that was just another thing that I wanted to point out with the whole witch influence that's going on here. So our team succeeds they beat this this group of ilkin um but they're all drained yes. they are all drained and they meet up lorkin Aline, and aelin's crew meet up and the first thing that happens is gavriel and fenris attack lorkin and Aline, being the strong young woman that she is, she jumps in front of them and she gets bit by Fenris. And Fenris immediately changes back from his wolf form and feels incredibly bad about this. And he's like, I didn't mean to bite her. I didn't mean to bite her. And at this point, Lorcan had put up a shield around her so that nobody else could hurt her. But she is bleeding to death. And Gavriel's like, I will not attack. Take your shield down. Let me heal her so she doesn't bleed to death. And Lorcan trusts him enough to do that because he knows as soon as he's done, Lorcan is going to die. That's the last of his magic that he can use right now. They're then going to attack him. He doesn't have any way of protecting himself. But at least Elid will survive. And then Aelin walks up and recognizes Elid. And Elid recognizes recognizes Aelin and then Adian's there too and it's such a sweet moment of them being kids again basically and recognizing the people that they grew up with and Aelin has this moment where she is so tearful and she gives Elid her mother's dying words which are tell my Elid that I love her and you can get the sense, and Elid gets the sense that she has been surviving so that she can tell Elid that. Like she wanted to make sure that she met Elid so that she could tell her the dying words of the woman that saved her. And Rowan, being smart as he is, figured out that since Aelin and Elid are basically family, and Elid and Lorcan have some sort of a relationship. He tells Fenris and Gavriel, if they attack Lorcan, it will be an act of war. And that can supersede the oath that they gave or the order that they have for a little while. And so he tells them, you know, if you attack Lorcan, it will be an act of war. And so a kind of ceasefire happens, which is great to see. Yeah, because in essence, Aelin announced that this is my court. I'm going to be the queen of Terrison. This is my court. And Ly Lysandra is included in that. We didn't even talk about Lysandra. I mean, it was like all hands on deck. It was all hands on deck to overcome this 500 Ilkin because Lysandra was out there riling up all the marsh creatures and stuff because there's some big predators out there to get them to attack the Ilkin as well. So, but Lysandra is a part of the court. And so Rowan having the foresight to say that would be an act of war. This is the court of the Queen of Terrison, like so good of him. They go back to their boats and they see a shit ton of ships around their boats. And you're like, what the fuck is going on now? Like they're out of magic. How are they going to like do this? 
Vampire storm, lots of ships, lots of ocean stuff. And so you're wondering what the hell is going on now. And then you see a red head with a wolf symbol ambling up, strutting up. And it is Ansel of Briarclaw. And she received the memo that Aelin was throwing at her when she was fighting and giving her name during her fights in Rifthold. And so Aelin, or Aelin was using Ansel's name and had dyed her hair red. And previously we're like, okay, she dyed it red to look like, what's his name? Shit. Arabin. The A names are throwing me off. Arabin. But she also had another ulterior motive to that because she wanted to look like Ansel too. So Ansel received that, and then she also received a note telling her to go to these coordinates. Like, she's calling in her blood oath, or her, what's the death, not death pact, but... Like debts. Yes, life debt is what I was going for. So Aelin called in her life debt, and Ansel came and answered that. So she has the ships now, and she is there to help. And an important part before this, because it has to do with this is while on the ship, before they were about to fight the Ilkin, Aelin had a conversation with Adian, where Adian was just so pissed off because I think he was worried about Lysandra and having to do the stuff that she was having to do, and he was just pissed off. And he's like, where are, like, Where are your allies? Where are these people you promised us? Because right now, I don't see you doing jack shit, basically, besides angering people with your magic like you brought these 500 on us because you acted out and now we're all in danger and i don't see any allies and so he like basically just let her have it and then he starts feeling a little bit bad because he's like oh shit she did really have allies for us and they were just making the like eight week trek to get here like come on like not everybody is Fenris and have teleporting abilities. Like, shit, guys. It takes some time. Adian lost some points from Tara in this scene, but, I mean, she can... Some points. Yeah, he, he can had have a pass. lot. He had, he, had, he had a lot. It's fine. He can have a pass. What gets me about this whole scene is Ansel swaggers up like her pirate self, and she introduces herself as the Queen of the Wastes. And Manon is standing there like, excuse me, bitch, queen of the waste. Excuse, That's excuse the fuck out of me? What? <laughs> and so Manon immediately hates her guts and has another enemy that she sees in her mind. And it was hilarious that Aelin's like, oh, well, you can take this part of the waste and they can take this part. And like, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. And Manon's like, um, excuse me, I don't share. <laughs> Um, but then we do see a conversation between Manon and Dorian and Dorian and Manon have been having this conversation about Dorian killing his father and how he feels bad about this. And she's like, you know, what makes you not a monster is that you feel bad about the people that you've killed. You feel bad about that loss. And Dorian love language speaker that he is, is like, tells her if I ever see your grandma, I'm going to stand on the other side of that line. Like, meaning he is going to take part in that death and he is going to enjoy the fuck out of killing her grandmother. Like, He's not going to feel bad. And I'm just like, go Dorian. And this is as they're about to start with some super spicy stuff that Sandra mentioned earlier, where he's using his powers on her and... I just, I'm team Minorian over here. Whether you like Elite and, and Lorcan or Aelin and Rowan, I am all about Manon and Dorian. It's just something about their energy. They have a slightly violent energy that is so exciting and fiery and spicy. And they, uh, they get up close and personal and get to know each other even better. And I uh, think... Huh? I think it's so much sweeter because they've both earned the hell out of it. Mm-hmm. So I think I like them because they're finally getting what they deserve. Somebody on their level that they can actually be with. And they've both grown so much mm-hmm. to be on that level. They've just experienced some of the worst shit in the series so far. So 
yes, they deserve their little slice of paradise in each other. And it's so funny because Tara was talking a little bit about this earlier with thin walls on the ship. But it's like, not only do Faze have heightened hearing, they can fucking smell. Like, it's almost like smelling a sex and attachment, like that physical attachment that, you know, Rowan and Aelin have together or Dorian and Manon. And everyone's just like, really? Really, Dorian? You're, you're braving that? Like, you're you're dumb enough to, like, touch that? And he's just so fearless at this point. It's- <laughs> well, and even Manon... Because Manon, after it happens, she's like, I can't, like, she's kind of like, I've never allowed somebody to do that before. Like, it's always been on her terms and her doing what she wants and never, like, her giving anything to the man, right? Dorian was on top. (laughs) Yes. And Dorian makes some sort of, like, snide little snip after. And Manon makes a comment about, You want to come back here and see where my iron is or something like that? (laughs) And it was just so funny because even though they like like each other, they're still like, I can kill you and it'd be okay. I don't like to use the word hate fuck, but it's so like in that realm, they're dynamic together. I don't know what it is. It's like she's at odds with like how she's been brought up and all of that stuff. And he was a shell of a person after being possessed by this demon, essentially, and then killing his own dad and then losing his best friend, Kaol, because Kaol is off, you know, in the southern continent. So he's an incomplete person, too. And she thinks of herself like a broken, twisted, incomplete kind of person. And so it's just it makes for such a fun perspective to read when it's either of them especially Manon she's just so entertaining and then (sighs) Maeve fucking shows up to ruin all the fun it's pretty much the Maeve scene for the rest of the book everyone is together things look dire yeah they have Ansel and her armada but they are still missing tons of people. Their power, as Tara said, has been tapped out fighting these 500 Ilkin, which was all by design because Maeve wanted to make sure that they were tired before they got to her. So there are ships. Rowan is freaking out because he has grown to love Aelin very much, and he, a part of himself is dying at the thought of losing her. So he's doing everything in his power. He takes to being a hawk, sneaks off to the other ships. He's trying to build allies with his family members and all these people from Terrison and the surrounding countries, trying to get them to swear loyalty to them and the best that they can be is, we'll consider it, right? These are his blood relatives and they're like, we'll consider it. And so that's the best that Roan can do. Lysandra is tired because of what she's been doing but there's going to be a lot on Lysandra as well kind of like the other scene um whenever she had to pretend to be a sea sea dragon it was a Mm -hmm. sea dragon she was just Tara's favorite person in that part and so everyone just has so much burden that they are carrying things look horrible and I can't remember Yeah, Dorian. Makes a decision to give some information that he just figured out, which is that this mirror that they found, he thinks is like something that tells them something. It's meant to give them information, not anything else. And so it's based off of the little like riddle or whatever that iron meets fire makes silver And then a truth will be revealed or something like that. I don't remember the exact quote, but he figures out that everybody has been led together for a reason. And Manon is iron and Aelin is fire and the mirror is silver. And so he's like, I think you two need to get together with this mirror and it's supposed to reveal a truth. Well, it sucks them in. It's a portal. Yeah. It's a portal, basically. Yeah. And it sucks them in. And Adian... And Rowan are so pissed off about this because they don't know where Aelin went. And she's with Manon, who they still have, like, very little faith in, right? And Maeve has just arrived, and all hell is about to break loose, and all of a sudden, Aelin's gone. And so I think it's Adian that punches Dorian. Yeah. 
and Dorian has a little black eye. And then screaming happens. And it's basically like Sandra said, it's the Maeve show now. It is go, go, go from here on. So they're trying to do their best to defend everything and buy time while Aelin comes back, hopefully, wherever she went off to. And we see from her and Manon's perspective, they go through this portal and they go to the past. They go, what is it, 500? No, 1,000 years in the past, isn't it? They go back to Elena's time. And so they're seeing all of the events that transpired there. And there are some huge reveals that start happening. They learn that Nameless is the price that Elena paid. This was what Gavin had such a problem with back then, why they butted heads at that prologue. Uh, at the beginning of the book. Well, they discovered that Nameless is the price. And so this is why Brandon had such a problem because if you remember, Brandon was nameless. He was a bastard and he was nameless. And so he was the price. And so it then basically put the price onto somebody else who was nameless. His bloodline, which was Dorian His, yeah. or Aelin. Yeah. And basically, the gods said, like, our sister's bloodline is the one that betrayed us. So Elena betrayed them because what was supposed to happen is they were supposed to go with the Vogue and go back to their home world. And then they were going to kill the Vogue in their home world. And that was the pact that Mala, who was a god, she was going to go back. And she was going to give up her earthly body. And Brandon made. And Brandon was going to die to make this, like, happen. And Mala died to make the lock. And they were then going to, like, end their lives to save the world. But then Elena stole it. And so the gods were like, our sister's bloodline has betrayed us. So our sister's bloodline needs to repay us. And so it basically put the debt onto either, like Sandra said, Dorian or Aelin. And then we get another little tidbit because Rhiannon Crocken was the one who helped them make that. So again, another reason why Manon needs to be there because Manon is the last Crocken queen. So she might have the power to help them rebuild this lock and see it to fruition. Through the portal, there was also a scene that took them to Eelway with Nehemia. And so we see, again, Sarah J. Mass just sprinkling those breadcrumbs all along throughout the series. There was a very vague chapter between a princess and a queen where they were talking about, you know, her being ready, Aelin uh, being the reference there. And... We learned that if it was between Dorian and Aelin being the one to be this price to pay now in the present, Dorian was never ready. It took more horrible things to happen for him to finally get there. If he ever got there, I think it actually broke him in a lot of ways. It just provides so much more context behind why Nehemia was behaving the way that she was and the things that she was working on, why she basically set up her own death to be the catalyst of Aelin finally accepting her heritage and what she needed to do. And so it was just all of these pieces coming together. And so I think those are pretty much the big things that we learned through the portal. And so all of the puzzle pieces are falling into place for Aelin, but she is understanding more, I think, than Manon is. Like Aelin is really putting it together and they haven't really disclosed it yet. Yeah. Well, Aelin also had a little bit of a jump start because she'd already put together that the Nameless was her. She had the brand of the Nameless on her forehead. And when they said Nameless is the price, she's like, oh, shit, that's going to be me. Like, she had figured that part out. And so she was already a little ahead of Manon yeah. in knowing that she was the Nameless. The Nameless, and the queen that was promised. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I think for a lot of the characters, they're like, okay, so she's the person that's going to end this. Like, it's all up to her. She is the chosen one. And Aelin is finding out a little bit more than that. But they come back through, but this time the portal takes them to the beach, right? So mm -hmm. as all of this skirmish and stuff is happening on the seas, Rowan and crew find out that Maeve is not with the Armada. She is on the beach. 
And Elide is on the beach because Lorcan sent her away to protect her, thinking that was going to be how they could best defend her. And so it ends up being Manon, Aelin, Maeve, Elid. There's some guards uh, that belong to Ansel and stuff on the beach. And then meanwhile, on the seas, Rowan's family came in clutch. They decided to show fealty to Aelin. And so they came in to help. But that's still not enough. And then we also get Abraxas finally shows back up. And he went to find the other 13. Yes. And so you get the witches coming back and they're coming in clutch too because they see Abraxas has a fealty to this group. And so they're like, well, I guess if he has one, then Manon does. And so they start attacking Maeve and the Fae, which at that point it was kind of a losing battle because Maeve had called Fenris and Gavriel away. And then also, you know, humans versus fey is a losing battle and so at that point our team our team was losing and then the 13 show up and our team starts winning again and winning strong when abraxas and the 13 are in the sky they're just like what is that flying at us and that was such an exciting momentum moment and then the 13 land and it's just pure bloodlust The way the scenes read, they're like enjoying the kill. They're like these Valkyrie women, these just warrior women, just doing what they do really well. That's a good way to put it because, yes, they they give off Valkyrie vibes and like Amazon vibes. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Um, So exciting to read. And then this this scene, the next scene is... ah, I hated it so much. I started losing some of my love for Lorcan. In the next scene, because we figure out some of the things that he did. And while you can understand why he did them, uh, uh, it's like KL all over. And I still have PTSD from fucking KL. But anyway. um, (laughs) (laughs) No, Natara, what makes it so bad is May was like, fuck you. I break the blood oath. Which, yes. I guess it's like losing a limb. It's like a very debilitating, um, mora- like morale-crushing thing to do. But he is still crawling on the ground toward her after the oath is broken. Just this worm just trying yes, to get back to her feet. <laughs> she did. Okay, so she ends up breaking the oath to Fenris. Or no, not Fenris. To Gavrielle. And... Lorcan and she does it dishonorably, which I think is why it's such a like a hit to them. Yeah. Um, because she was forced to break it honorably to Rowan and it was less of a hit to him. So I think it's the dishonorably, like their honor was called into question and everybody will know it. But yes, he like Gavriel's just kind of like stunned. Like he's just like sitting there, like, I gave up my whole life for you, and this is how you treat me, kind of thing. And, like, feeling his feelings. And Lorcan is, like, he even says something along the lines that he did everything for her before she broke it. And that was just, like, a gut punch to Lee because she's, like, oh, so you never had true feelings for me. It was all for her. Yeah, it's a very demoralizing thing. Elite is just standing there. Everyone has seen this relationship blossom between her and Lorcan and so she has an audience and then to be basically the third party the other woman it's just crushing so she's just all upset and angry and all of the feelings too but Gavriel honor is so important to him and not like blind honor he's just a very honorable man and for him to be treated that way it was it was just such a loss to them because I think you were getting at this too is when a, when an oath is dishonorably broken, they are basically branded like their presence. It's like an aura that sticks with them that they are dishonorable. And so that's, that's why it's such a big thing for him. But Maeve is just our all time favorite. A person. bitch queen. <laughs> a bitch queen. <laughs> Not in the way that Lorcan meant it toward Aelin, but she is just a straight up bitch queen. And we see Maeve drag an iron box 
to shore. I want to point something else out before we get into that, because she is also tormenting poor Aelin, because Aelin figured out, Aelin's super smart. She's figured out everything so far, right? She's like 10 steps ahead of everybody. And she figured out that Rowan is actually her mate, not just somebody she loves, but he is the person that was destined to be with her. And Maeve points out that she knew this. And that is the reason she put Lyria in Rowan's way and then killed Lyria and then blood oathed Rowan because she saw the future and saw that he was going to be the mate of the person that was the promised queen. And so she started tormenting his life like thousands of like hundreds of years ago, not thousands, hundreds of years ago to set him up to be the tortured person that she could control. Mm-hmm. And thus, she would have control over Aelin. Maeve has Aelin in such a chokehold, and to add salt to the wound, Rowan is still stuck at sea. He's trying to get to the coast because he knows that's where Aelin and Maeve are having a showdown. And because Aelin's love language, like Tara, is sacrifice, Maeve is threatening to take a lead back to her kingdom that she... Just her kingdom. And... Aelin doesn't want that to happen. She's just gotten Elite back. Elite has been through so much with Vernon and being in Morath and cannot let that happen. So she makes a deal with Maeve to trade, like, not trade places, but leave Elite alone. I will go with you. And before they even go, to make it worse, Maeve is like, cool. So meet my new general, Karen, who is bad news. He's almost like grave is what I pictured in my mm-hmm. mind, just really likes the violence and hurting people, just a sick bastard, and has Aelin whipped in front of everyone, and no one can do anything about it. I think this was before they were oathed, like the it was broken. De-oathed. So, yeah, be- de-oathed. And it is a horrible scene, because you know Aelin. She is stubborn. She will not drop her principles and her values Maeve tells her to count to 10 the, the whips, and Aelin refuses to do that. She refuses to kneel at Maeve. And I, it was a hard scene to read because you think about her back just being straight up hamburger at this point. Like, though, there's some flesh, there's some skin still hanging on there, but. And that was a quote from Karen is, oh, there's some skin left. And it's like, if you have to preface that with there's some skin left, like there's not enough to continue. Yeah. So then she takes an iron mask, puts it onto Aelin's face, and we know iron basically nullifies magic and you can't access your powers. So has her put this iron mask on, locks her in an iron box, and they sail away and then trans, like they vanish. The whole ship just incredible power and then Rowan shows up too late and is beside himself and then we see Lorcan and Elid have a moment and dear lord I've never wanted to say the words that somebody else has said so bad but Elid's parting words to Lorcan is something along the lines of I hope you spend your life suffering like I hope you never find love I hope you never like so like whoa Damn. This is huge for Elid because she is so not that person to hold grudges like that, you know? She genuinely loves and cares about people, but she well, and- felt so strongly hurt that, yeah. She felt hurt, and then we also discovered that Lorcan is the one who sent for Maeve there. He called her to them, and he says it was because he noticed the Armada and he wanted Maeve to help them. But, like, are you dumb? Like, I never got dumb vibes off of you before. Like, you knew Maeve wanted Aelin. So, like, I I don't get how he thought that Maeve was going to help them. Not to end this on a huge downer, there are a few big wins, I guess, that do happen. And we do find out that Rowan and Aelin married in secret with only Lysandra there as they were strategizing on how to do this, because Aelin knew that there was always a chance that they were going to lose, that things would be very bad if her allies couldn't appear in time. And so she married Rowan, ensuring that her kingdom would have 
a rightful a king. ruler. Mm-hmm. But also that Lysander would shapeshift into Aelin to make it believable and accepted among all of the people. And everyone has a fucking cow about this. Just angry. Rightfully so on Adian's part, because he was expected to father the children so that they would look like Aelin. Yeah. And he's like, um, so how are you going to convince me to, like, basically fuck my cousin? I mean, I guess Lysandra like, could shapeshift back into herself for these moments. I don't know. I don't know. Well, that, I don't know. That's what he said. He's like, at, at what point were you going to convince me to, like, breed with her? And I'm like, you got a good point. Like, you're basically be, being used as a stallion. I mean, it was a very far-fetched plan, right? I think it was one definitely born of desperation. Like, what powers do we have? What talents and abilities do we have? And how could we make this work for as long as possible? So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and then, so we also see a couple more things. Um, we see when Elite tells Lorcan, like, basically the biggest F you ever, she goes back to the witches, and the witches basically swear allegiance to Aelin. And they were like, you know what? She gave her life for one of us, and so now we are down. Like, we are here for it. Like, let's not let that be in vain. And so you have the 13 on our side and the Kraken, because Manon is going to go and round up the Kraken and see if they'll fight under her as the last Kraken queen. So we could have an army of Kraken and the 13, which is basically an army in and of themselves. And then... We see some of those other life debts being called in that Aelin did. And then Aelin's like, oh, motherfucker, I was wrong. But you see first, Galen Ash River shows up. And he's like, where is Aelin? She sent me a note that you forgot about us 10 years ago. Like, we never forgot about you. Do you even remember Evelyn Ash River? Like, come here now. And so he shows up with his armada, right? And he's looking for Aelin. And then you see some other people show up. And they speak with a weird accent. And Ansel recognizes them right away. (laughs) And it's the silent assassins, like a shit ton of them. And they're like, where's Aelin? And Aelin's like, shit, she really did get an army of thieves. Commoners commoners and like all these that she promised them she's like i won't turn my back on you like you're doing to me i will round up an army of thieves of commoners of like just the people you would not rolf Mm -hmm. him too you like pirates and i forgot what her quote was but it was like i will i will bring an army of thieves pirates whatever else assassins because i think ansel is the thief and then Rolf and whatever. Anyway, so she brought this army. And then you see Lysander come out as Aelin. And so we're starting our pretending to be Aelin right now. And then you also get, which is probably the saddest part of this damn book, you get Rowan and also something that makes me mad. So Rowan didn't want to admit that Aelin was his mate. Because he felt like it was mean to Lyria. And I'm like, dude. He didn't want to tarnish her memory, I, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, but if she's your mate, she's your mate. Like, you don't get to take something away from somebody else because somebody died. Like, just admit it. And he's like, well, I had feelings. And I'm like, I don't fucking care. Like, you were stopping yourself from going all the way in your feelings because you were worried about somebody who died 500 years ago. But you do see him own up to the fact that Aelin is his mate, only after she disappears. Yeah, it makes all of these little moments, like back in Mistward, whenever he was training her, the first time he bit into her neck and he had a weird reaction when she was getting inexplicably jealous of all these people in the kitchen checking him out just this possession that he showed even like Rowan showed toward Adian and stuff just this weird jealousy all of these are like okay classic mate this is what happens they get weirdly possessive 
and territorial. And his like weird like thing with Fenris who wanted to be the person to train her. And he's like, no, stay away. And uh, like also when Fenris is like making his comments about her and stuff, which I think are cute, but Rowan's like, shut up, dude. (laughs) We like Rowan. We do. It takes him a little while to learn. Not as long as some people like Hale, which it's, Next week, we are talking about Tower of Dawn, part one, which, Tara, we're doing this to you again because right before Queen of Shadows, we took a break from Air of Fire to go back in time to the Assassin's Blade, so you had to wait to see what was going to happen next. And now it's like the same thing happening because we're going to read Tower of Dawn, which doesn't follow any of these people. All we know is Kaol went to the Southern Continent to the Torre Chesme, which... We hopefully will run into a little healer named Irene. It's been a couple years, so let's see if she backed up what she told Selena at the time that she was going to do. I'm waiting for her to come back because then we have witches. And it was that was also pointed out. We have the queen of the witches, basically. We have the queen of Terrison. We have the king of Otterland. So basically, we have three of the like rulers in one little boat. And then if we have somebody that's a healer, like I'm just assuming in my head that she became like a fabulous healer and is now like running the damn school or something and can provide healers for this battle that's coming up. And then we have the silent assassins and we have Ansel, who is the queen of the wastes. And then we have the 13 and then we have the king of the fae. Or, well, the prince, crown prince of the face. And so we're, like, getting, like, this, like, who's who of powerful people coming together. And I'm just, I'm just waiting. I don't like the fact that Aelin, at least at this point, has to die for this to come into power. But I am also kind of looking forward to the next book because I'm hopeful that I won't hate Kale so much by the end of it. I've been promised that this is, like, his, like, redemption arc So I'm hopeful that I will like him again because, yeah, I'm I'm just hopeful. And I'm hopeful that Lorcan will crawl out of his little, like, fucking ass and do something. Because right now, like, he just, he's like, Kale, he just chose the wrong side. He chose the wrong side and he didn't learn from his actions. Do not cross Tara. You will pay for it for the rest of your life. And if you cross me, like, <laughs> learn from your, like, actions and make it better. Like, I'm, I'm willing to give Kale another shot. He just has to prove that he learned. We'll see. He's, uh, he's limited to a wheelchair right now, which is better than... Uh, which is what he deserves until... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. Really? No. Um... <laughs> He wasn't that bad. What? <clears throat> there was... Oh, oh, oh. Did we forget something major? Yeah, there were a couple of major things. During this whole exchange on the beach with Maeve, Aelin did slip the keys as one little trickster thing to Manon, which was why Manon could not do anything to bring attention to herself because she did sl- slip the word keys to Manon. She's very good at this underhand stuff. Um well, and, she is an assassin. Uh-huh. And then Maeve also told Aelin that she predicted that Aelin was only five years from the settling, which is when they come into their immortality as a fae, essentially. So that was an interesting little tidbit. She um, would have had thousands of years with Rowan. Yeah. So Rowan, I mean, the end scene is Rowan just beside himself. Because to have your mate taken away and you, he can't sense her either because she's locked in a box. So he can't sense her anymore, which would be like a big hole in his heart. So I don't know. There were so, there were so many action packed scenes, so many like love things coming. Um, so many love scenes too. Well, who was your favorite character in this book? Favorite overall character is still Aelin because I like how smart and like just 10 steps ahead she is of everybody. I like Fenris's comedy because we really needed some comedy in this this book, like heavily needed it. 
Lysandra's still like the shit because Lysandra's the shit. Elide is great. Like I can't just pick one because like they all had their moments. I guess all the women had moments because so far, besides Fenris, I'm just naming the women. Lorcan pissed me off, so no. <laughs> um Adian is still great, although this this book wasn't his like finest moments to me. I, Rowan, I, I liked a lot just because like Rowan's Rowan. But still not his finest moments. Like, I did like that he went to his family and begged. And he's like, that woman is, like, it for me. Like, please help us. Yeah. And that was great. So Rowan's on my, like, up there list. Rolf really didn't do anything. Maeve's, like, down here, like, negative a thousand. Manon is great. Dorian, Dorian Rose. Uh, so, yeah, I don't have... That sounded... <laughs> Get your mind out of the gutter, Sandra. Like, every time I mention Dorian, it's not sexual. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah, so, I don't know. I don't know if I have a favorite. They're all, like, wonderful, besides the few that I mentioned that aren't wonderful. It were... I don't like Elena very much right now. You know what? Elena reminds me a lot of Selena Sardothian, just, like, going rogue and doing her thing and just trying to be scrappy, just you know, breaking protocol. She does strike me as being young and just wanting put off the worst, you know, like not face it type of thing. Yeah, but like, why can't she just tell? Like, why couldn't she just tell them like what was going to happen at the beginning? Like, just lay it out. Don't like make them like work to figure out what the fuck's going on with their lives. Like, you uh, you fucked them over. (laughs) Just tell them you fucked them over. She justified her actions by... Oh, that was a huge thing that we did find out in the portal was she saved Aelin's life as a child. Aelin died in that river. She did not make it. Aelin, uh, Elena brought her back to life. And And called Erebin. Yes. She basically summoned Erebin to come there and find her, knowing what was going to happen to her. But in Elena's mind, she wanted... Aelin to have some kind of life before the reality and the weight of everything that was coming was going to get shoved down her throat. So it's almost like she wanted to let her just live her life, I think is what she said, and be ignorant of all of that so it wasn't looming over her and she could actually live her life. And we see that Aelin did just that as Selena. She killed, did missions, bought things, lived how she wanted, tried to have a life with Sam, did all of these different things, but just couldn't run away from it when things started escalating and the gods started knocking. So it's going to be interesting skipping, um, like not jumping into the final book, Kingdom of Ash. But I, I'm interested to see what you think of Tower Dawn because it is... Uh, I enjoyed it. It was a very different kind of fantasy book, but more thrilling, if that makes sense, like psychological and um, a little more thriller, suspense type of thing, in my opinion. Mm. But I'll see what you feel. I'm like, oh, Tara might like that. Tara might vibe with that. So we hope you enjoyed this discussion of part two of Empire of Storms by Sarah J. Mass. Tune in next Tuesday as Tara and I cover part one of Tower of Dawn. And if you haven't already, please remember to like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed this discussion. Comment what some of your favorite parts or if there were key parts that we didn't mention. Definitely call those out too. I'm always interested to see what people's like favorite biggest things were. So thank you so much and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.